Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. This is J.R. Moore coming to you live from deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks on Wednesday, the 31st day of October, year of our Lord, 2012. As always, there's, or as most days, there's some important earth change headlines at sandadeo.com that I encourage you to take a look at. Today, however, I'm going to talk about revealing a secret. I've done this before, but we do have new listeners all the time, especially all you YouTube people out there. If you don't understand your history, our history, as human beings living on this planet, you don't have a beginning point. You, you don't have a clue or who we are as human beings occupying this planet. And the secret I'm going to talk about today is well known by every current and former president, every current and former United States senator, many people, hundreds, possibly thousands of people, men and women, who are part of what we generically call the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, NASA, of course, uh, the various lettered agencies, as we also sometimes call them, a secret that is very well known in certain circles and very heavily suppressed to the general public, the secret of the Black Knight Satellite, the Black Knight Satellite. I, I read a book. This is about seven or eight years ago. The title of it, Dead Men's Secrets, by uh, Jonathan Gray, the archaeologist that I've interviewed uh, several times on my radio show, a New Zealand archaeologist, Dead Men's Secrets. The first page of the first chapter, Jonathan Gray talks about the Black Knight satellite. Here's the deal. The Black Knight satellite was discovered in the late in, by modern men in the late 1950s. It was only a few months later that in the middle of the night, the duty officer at the White House woke up a five-star general who happened to be president of the United States. You don't wake up a five-star general in the middle of the night unless it's really, really important. General Eisenhower, president of the United States. So the duty officer wakes up the president. Mr. President, we have a crisis. The president put on his dressing gown or whatever he wore, his, his bathrobe. Maybe he got dressed, I don't know. Went down to the Situation Room in the White House. And he was briefed on what they knew at the moment, that they had found a satellite on a polar orbit. Now, we couldn't do polar orbits, by the way, back in the late 1950s. It's, it's only been, oh, since the late 70s, early 80s, that we could do polar orbits with our man-made objects. Sir, we found a satellite. We know two of its three, and we know its dimensions. Well, I know, th I know two. John Moore knows two of its three dimensions. Forty by seventy feet. Now, <laughs> at the time, our biggest object on Earth, uh, uh, on, in space, excuse me, a man-made object in space with the size of a basketball. Forty by seventy feet. I don't know the third dimension. It's not for lack of trying. It's on a polar orbit, sir. And, and I'm sure the President uh, Eisenhower listened carefully to the briefing and thanked the uh, briefing officer and went back to bed. Maybe he stayed up. I don't know. Black Knight Satellite is 40 by 70 feet. I don't know the third dimension, whether it's 10 feet or 20 feet or 30. It doesn't matter, not really. It's 23,000 miles above the surface of the planet, just below the Van Allen radiation belt. It's estimated, in the best sources I have, to be about 12,000 years old. Its other nickname is the chirogenic box. Now, I know... What many of you are going to do, there's literally eight to 10,000 people, maybe more, 20,000, who will listen to this show in the archives and on uh, YouTube over the next few days and weeks. 
You'll go to Google and try to do a Google search on the Black Knight satellite. Good luck. So I read about this thing, and I'm having lunch with a friend of mine who's connected to the lettered agencies. Typical adult male friendship, relationship. We may get together once a year or so and, and get caught up on the things that uh, we're concerned about. So we're having lunch, and he's very jovial, and, and we're talking about different topics and very friendly, and, and uh, we're just enjoying our, our company with each other. And I asked him the following question. Tell me what you know about the Black Knight satellite. My friend's demeanor changed instantly. He went from being jovial and uh, very upbeat to being very, very serious instantly. John, that's highly classified. I've been looking into this on my own for more than 10 years, approaching 20 years. What tell me what you know about the Black Knight satellite? So I went on to tell him what I knew, which dovetailed pretty much with what he knew. We did not have the lift capability to get that high up, 23,000 miles up with men until probably the... Uh, uh, the, at the time in the late 60s when we were making allegedly, I say allegedly because we didn't go to the men with men, in the late 60s, I believe personally that most of the NASA money, a large, probably the overwhelming majority of it was spent to get enough, uh, get the wherewithal to get up there and get access to the Black Knight satellite. Sometimes... By the late 60s or mid to late 70s, we had the ability, the wherewithal, to get 23,000 miles above the planet and start trying to figure out what this thing was. So you get up there. You get 23,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. You get within a few feet of the Black Knight satellite. You take photographs. You take measurements. You take every kind of reading that you can uh, with your technology at the time you you have a number of goals one of them is to figure out the docking mechanism so you can come back down to the surface of the earth fabricate a docking mechanism and go back up there the goal obviously is to gain access to the contents of the black knight satellite so you can recover the technology that's in there and begin the process of understanding it and reverse engineering it. Now, <laughs> this is where the, the trail starts going cold. A friend of mine is very close personal friends with a U.S. senator. I told him the story about the Black Knight satellite, and he says, well, I'll ask my friend about it. And I said, you do that. You talk to your friend, the U.S. senator. So he talks to him, and he asks him the following question. So, Mr. Senator, I have to eliminate names here, obviously. Tell me what you know about the, about the Black Knight satellite. The senator, his response was, you tell me first what you know. It's the nature of men and women who know classified information that they won't even begin to reveal it unless you, they think and believe that you already know uh, pretty much as much as they do about it, then they're not really disclosing anything, not revealing any secrets, if you already know the secret. Most U.S. senators are out of the loop. The U.S. senator did reveal to my friend that he was aware of the Black Knight satellite, he was aware of the size, the uh, age of it, how high above the planet it is. And, but even he didn't know about recovering what was inside there in any detail. The Black Knight satellite is one of many examples of our ancestors having and using technology every bit as advanced and, quite frankly, in my opinion, more advanced than what we have right now. The evidence is clear and well-defined that this is true. 
we had a caller call in. Uh, I'm just going to call him, refer to him as Mike. He says he he knows the third dimension of the Black Knight satellite, 20 feet. I'll buy that. I, I've always thought it would be in some multiple of 10 feet. Uh, you would need enough thickness to protect whatever was in there from the elements. Go with 20 feet. 40 by 70 by 20 feet. Sure, why not? We Even today, we can't, we us modern humans, cannot put one object up to that big. We can bring up a lot of things like our space station and bolt them together once they're up there. We can't put one object that large in space by itself at one time. Unless you understand who we are as human beings occupying this planet, you're hopelessly lost. That's the point of this. You hear a lot about the Mayans and the Mayan calendars. calendar. Well, the Mayans were doing mathematical calculations to ten decimal points. That's no small thing. That's no small thing at all. The point being, ladies and gentlemen, every 3,600 years, our planet goes through a cycle and we get smacked and we get smacked real bad we get smacked back down into the mud and about every third cycle we just about get wiped off the surface of the planet that's how bad it is and I don't know how bad it'll be this cycle but it certainly has that potential we have a caller in hold here, as you've been waiting very patiently. George in Wisconsin. Good morning, George. Hey, good morning. Listen, I'm uh, putting the finishing touches on my November newsletter, and I like the spelling of that word night. Is it like night in shining armor or yes, three-dog yes. night? Uh, night in shining armor. You All right, it. good. Also, uh, another report I called in maybe a couple of weeks back. We got more Russian troops coming here to Camp McCoy here in Wisconsin, and I saw two more transport planes just yesterday. And that makes a total of uh, eight now that I've seen, plus one flying boxcar. Can so uh, well, flying boxcar is kind of an antiquated term. Uh, uh, yeah, so, I believe. Oh, go sorry, buddy. Go ahead. Can you identify the aircraft uh, better than that, George, as to uh, with the color and type? Just the army color, because they're very low. They come right over my house oh. on approaching oh. the runway, and okay. they were four-engine uh, gas jobs. Okay. I called in. I think. Uh, Turbo Mike, prop C-130s, you know what C-130 is? Uh, no, but uh, Mike Harris, when I was explaining to him one time when I called in, he uh, gave the technical number for the flying boxcar, but I didn't write that down. Well, that's, that's what they used to call the old C-119. Oh. Uh, but uh, the C-130 has been a workhorse of the Air Force for about 40 years, and, mm -hmm. um, of course, they got the C-17 now, which is... Uh, two uh, large jets. But, uh, well, uh, we appreciate the update, uh, George. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, and at uh, Fort McCoy, that also is a FEMA camp and also a prison about 20 miles from here, Oxford Prison. That's a FEMA camp and has a lot of uh, United Nation trucks parked in a yard in the back road. One of my friends was down there and got chased out. So, Are they all the good work, brother. Is all, everything you're describing inside the perimeter of Fort McCoy? Well, I've not been there myself. So okay. I only know they're on their approach and they're landing there. And the reason I knew they were Russian is a brother from down in Kansas called me the very same day to tell me, hey, man, you know you got Russian troops there? So <laughs> that's the guess, man. Oh, listen, <laughs> down in Coffeyville, Kansas, where he's at, Russian troops came in a coffee shop there because him and a couple of brothers get there together every morning and discuss things. And a lot of them got up and walked out, and they knew they were Russians just the way they stood and their haircuts. And also uh, when they spoke. Well, that's a dead giveaway. Okay. Yes, sir. Real good. Thanks for the call. Later, man. Bye-bye. We're out of time. You'll be safe out there by lots of ammunition. Never, ever give up your guns. <laughs>